someone at my house. My husband is in my yard acting crazy, threatening me, threatening my dad. And what's your name? Katie Griggs. Katie Griggs. Katie Griggs. Katie Griggs. Katie Griggs. Katie Griggs. My daughter is the same as her and you're making threats against the situation. Okay, what is this demeanor, sir? Possible. I just called, y'all said you were sending some women in work into my house. Please. Please, first. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for getting in touch with me. It's good to see you face to face. After the first season of It Couldn't Happen Here, I started getting social media messages from people about cases they felt needed attention. I'm an eighth grade math teacher, and in 2013, a really good friend of mine reached out and said, something bad's happened. It's another one of our kids is gone too soon. A former student of mine in Andrew, North Carolina, had been shot by his father-in-law, who was a pastor. And it was said it was self-defense. Why didn't that sit well with you? Because it did not match the kid that I knew in eighth grade. Christian Griggs was a student of mine. There was zero aggression in Christian. He never had any type of conflict. He was one of those students that just always stands out intelligent, from a good family, just really going places, and I haven't seen Christian since he was in high school. I'm sure he had changed over time, and, and maybe he did do something to initiate an argument, but it just didn't match at all, and it immediately was a red flag to me to try to reach out about his case. This situation is exactly what our show is about. You know, you've got a school teacher who, all these years later, is trying to shed light on her student's death and all the unanswered questions that are surrounding that. And it's that level of care and compassion that we know makes small towns so special. We're well, just a plain simple town with a lot of a lot of good people here. The people here are generally friendly, family oriented. You don't really meet strangers. We try to get along. And we make the best of everything. If it's a good situation, we try to make good of that. If it's bad, we try to make good of that. We just live and let live. Your typical small town, uh, everybody knows everybody, the people seem to be nice. It seemed like a nice family time. When we moved to Andrew, Christian was around five years old. You know, it was a good school system and a nice place to raise your kids. There were a few small things that we had to address with my son, Christian, as far as racial issues in town. But in a small town like this, when people don't get out and don't know anything different, sometimes you have to educate them by way of presence. In high school, Christian started dating Katie Chisholm. Her dad, Pat Chisholm, was a preacher. It was Christian's senior year when he told us that Katie was pregnant. They had a child and they named her Jaden. But it didn't work out. On October 11th, uh, Christian was on fall break at North Carolina State. And he was supposed to have Jaden that night. So that Friday, Christian came in the house, and we thought he would have Jaden with him, but he was alone. So my wife asked him, where's Jaden? We thought Jaden would be with him. He really didn't say anything, and he went upstairs. 
the next morning. Chris went back to the Chisholm Hall's house to get Jaden. I looked at my phone. It had to be about 9 o'clock in the morning. I had several missed calls. It was Christian. So I called him back. The line had a lot of static in it, and it cut. The Chisholm Hall's house is just a short distance from here, but the connectivity is cool. I jumped in my truck, and I drove over there. I pulled in behind Christian. I said, what's going on? He said, they're not here as usual. I'm here to pick up Jaden, and there's nobody here at the house. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to hang out, and I'm going to wait for them to come back. And he asked me to go ahead and leave. So I left, as Christian asked me to do. But I wish I would have stayed. And as I walked in the door to my house, my phone rang again. It was Christian. This time he said, Dad, this guy is over here telling me to shut the F up. I said, Christian who? He said, Pat. I drove over there. When I arrived at the house, it was quiet. It was serene. I thought something about this is not quite right. And as I walked across the yard and stepped up upon the steps, I saw the window closest to the door had been pushed in slightly at the top, kind of like a double hung window where you would fold it down. I reached out my right hand and ring the doorbell. And I looked to my immediate right and there was Christian laying on the ground face down. I did not know what had happened to him. I kneeled down by his side and almost instantaneous, police cars began to come from everywhere. Arnold County Sheriff Department. They jump out of their vehicles, weapons drawn, run up on the porch, see me, say, we, we've got a call, shots fired, there's been a shooting. And I said, it must be my son. They immediately pushed me off the porch. I then called my wife, Dolly, and I said, Christian's been shot. Dolly screams, and the phone goes dead. I just remember dropping the phone and I told my daughter, Crystal, that Christian had been shot. And we just ran out the door. I didn't have my purse, I didn't have my shoes on. When we got there, the EMT was doing CPR on my son. And one of the deputies came off the porch and said they were going to take Christian to wake Ned. And I said, is he still alive? And he said, yes. get to the hospital and eventually the doctor comes in and says he didn't make it. he didn't make it. the doctor says he didn't make it fell to the floor. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Dan told us the magnitude of his injuries at that point. But one of the trauma nurses that was in the room said whatever would happen, he was trying to get out of there.
When this shooting happened, the media immediately reported on it. But there is always more to the story than what you can get out of that initial headline. And so right now, we are meeting with Robbie Jessup. He is a local attorney who knows all about this town and this case. If you could walk me through what happened that day in October. Christian has arrived to pick up his daughter and somehow this all dominoes into Christian shot by Patches and Hall, his father-in-law. Yes. Katie was living immediately next door to Mr. Chisholm Hall. According to Katie, the night before the shooting, this is October 11th, 2013, Christian arrived to pick up Jake and discovered Katie's neighbor has taken Jaden to the zoo that day. And according to Katie, Christian gets upset about that and attempts to enter the home through a window with an air conditioning unit. Mm -hmm. So then what happened? Christian leaves and then Katie goes that night and swears out herself with a magistrate misdemeanor warrants for damaging an air conditioner and for trespass. The following morning on the day of the shooting, Katie and Pat had gone to try to get a restraining order against Christian, which they never obtained. Mm -hmm. They are arriving back at Mr. Chisholm Hall's house. Christian showed up and there was an interaction with Christian for some period of time. Okay. When the police interview Pat and Katie, what is their version of what happened that morning? The police did a reenactment with Mr. Chisholm Hall of how exactly he claimed the shooting took place. And I was standing about right here, I saw his car coming. I told him he'd leave. He said he needed to go and he would just rage, rage. Him. And he said, I'll, I'll kick your ass and ass right here. And, and he pushed me back like that. And, and I turned and I saw him standing on the porch holding his cell phone. And I said, go in the house, call 911, lock the door. Hi, I need someone at my house. My husband is in my yard acting crazy. He ran and got on the porch and banging on the doors, banging on the windows, yelling, cursing, demanding Katie come out. He was running everywhere, yelling. It was truly, truly scary. While Katie is on that first 911 call, another call comes in from Pat Chisenhall. My daughter is the same person as you making threats against us this morning. Can you go inside and lock your doors and windows and avoid any further confrontation with him until an officer can arrive? Okay. Chisholm Hall then says he goes in the residence and Christian is trying to come into the home. We were pushing fiercely like this and I, I don't remember how long but I, we managed to get it closed and I locked it like that. And I was here and all of a sudden the wind just just I got somewhere here, and I looked, and his head was sticking in. And I don't remember the specifics, but he said, I'll kill you. Pat Chisinau claims he was in fear of his life. I was afraid. And there was a 22 rifle right there. I grabbed that one. I came right in here. I, I, think, I think I fired from here. Mr. Chisenhall claims he shoots from inside of his living room at Christian, who is coming through that window. Okay. That's a scary story. What is Katie's version of what happened that morning? Katie says she was hiding in a closet and didn't see anything. What does law enforcement see when they get there? There were some photographs taken showing the condition of the residence. There was some fingerprint dusting done on a window screen mm -hmm. and inside of the house, three shell casings were found. Can you tell me a little bit about Pat Chisholm Hall? 
Mr. Chisenhall was a reverend, operated the Abundant Life Ministry Center. His family was born and raised Harnett County, through and through Harnett County. Mm -hmm. And so the story that immediately starts circulating that Pat Chisenhall shot in self-defense. That narrative was put into the news immediately. New information tonight about a shooting in Harnett County. Investigators say no charges have been filed. They believe the pastor acted in self-defense. I was an investigative reporter at WRAL News here in Raleigh, North Carolina. At the time, we did not have a lot of information directly from the authorities, but we spoke to members of Pat's church, people who had talked to Pat and heard the stories from that day. His son-in-law had tried to break in the house, uh, threatened him, and uh, he had no other recourse to do but what he did. It was in self-defense. As a result, the narrative that emerged was really Pat Chisholm's narrative, that this was a case of self-defense. And that was all there is to it. After the shooting, we were home. And we had the TV on. And the story came up on the news. And we were just astounded when we saw the photographs of the crime scene. The window had been bashed and pushed in. And we thought, that didn't look like that when we were there. That window wasn't like that. And we're like, what is going on here now? Sustain that. A couple months. 
and then he said that he was failing, couldn't concentrate, he was grades as well, and uh, he just felt like the best thing he could do was to just join the military so that he could take care of his family. I don't think I've ever cried so hard in my life because he's just going through so much and there's nothing you can do yeah. but be there for him. Does he come back here to live? He went to go live with the Chisholm Hall. Did he talk about his relationship with her family? Did he like them? He looked up to Pat, you know, but I don't think Pat was happy that his daughter fell in love with a black man and Christian had a black family. That's not what he wanted for his child. Christian had always kind of mentioned, like, I'm not sure if her dad likes me. He's an old white guy, you know, deeply rooted in Hornet County. I think that was tough for Christian because he was seeking acceptance from somebody who didn't want to give it to him. So there was a lot of things that were going against Christian and Katie. But in the beginning, they seemed to make it work. And Katie's father was actually the, the presiding minister over the wedding. He was the one who actually married them. I did want things to work out for Christian, but I wasn't naive to see that the path was very challenging for him. I was here one evening, and the phone rang. I picked up the phone, and it was Christian's voice on the other end. He said, Dad, our convoy was out, and the vehicle in front of me was hit. I said, what do you mean, son, hit? He said, it was an IED. My next question was, is everybody all right? He said, no, Dad. Some of my friends didn't make it. Having been in combat and experiencing that for myself, I could tell that it had changed the man in which Christian was. August 2011, Christian's ended his tour in Iraq, and he's living with Katie, but it is clear that there is some turmoil there. I believe that Christian being deployed was difficult for Katie, too. And I know Christian had a hard time when he came home. One of the things that my colleagues and I thought was really important with this case was to try to tell the full story, to try to um, understand all of the factors that were coming into play that led them to this moment. In May of 2012, Katie calls 911, and she told dispatchers that her husband was threatening to commit suicide. But the officer says he talked to Christian, who basically said, you know, I got this gun out of my safe, mostly to scare my wife. But Christian did admit to being depressed since he returned home from overseas. It was serious enough that the officer took that gun for safekeeping. About four months later, Katie calls 911 again to say that Christian Griggs is suicidal. And when an officer arrives, Christian says, I haven't talked to my wife in a couple of hours, but we are separated and that separation has been a little rough. The very next day, Katie calls the authorities again. And this time, what she tells them is that Christian is outside her home in Andrew, and he's angry about the custody situation. This is a theme that has begun to emerge in this separation. There are challenges between Katie and Christian over custody. Ultimately, Christian and Katie had pretty much officially called it quits, and he decided to get back in school. So... There's been a pattern that's been established with custody of Jaden. Can you talk to me a little bit about what that looked like? He would have Jaden every other weekend. Did he typically pick her up on Friday nights, Saturday mornings? If he could get her on Friday night, then he would come back to Saturday. One time he was here until like 7 o'clock at night, Saturday. And I know he kept calling Katie, just waiting for Jaden to get back. And so, you know, it's very upsetting because this is supposed to be his time with his daughter. That happened a lot. She made it difficult. Saturday, October 12, 2013. What we know about what happened that day is sort of pieced together based on statements from people who were there and from these 911 calls. Hi, County 911, what is your name? 
my daughter is estranged her this year making threats against the situation. One of the things that's interesting about these 911 calls was that it's not entirely one-sided. You do hear Christian in the background. A very interesting and important fact is during Pat Chisenhall's 911 calls, Christian himself is on the phone trying to reach an attorney and calling his father and Christian was communicating to him he was the one feeling threatened by the Chisenhalls. We knew that there was no way that Christian was trying to break into their home because Christian's never done anything like that before. This was a narrative that they put out there. You're talking about a young black man being violent and going into someone's home and it's an interracial marriage. What's the first thing that's gonna come to your mind? He's justified. He should have got shot. So this is the narrative that gets put out into the community. That seems insurmountable. What happens after that? So when the autopsy report came in, I looked at it. It said he was shot four times in the back. I expected this man was going to be arrested. I spoke with the district attorney, Vernon Stewart, and I said, well, Christian was shot in the back. Why isn't this man hasn't been charged? He said, well, I can't just charge a man for shooting somebody in the back. And I said, well, under what pretenses can you tell me it's acceptable to shoot a man in the back? And his response was, I'm not going to fuss with you. Do they give you a reason why they're not going to press charges? We found out because Pat Chisholm said that Christian tried to break into their home. They were going to try to use the Castle Doctrine in Christian's case. What that doctrine says is that if someone's coming into your house, there is a presumption that you are in fear of your life and you have a legal right to use deadly force. So Pat was largely portrayed as the victim and law enforcement were extremely clear they were considering this self-defense and that no charges of any sort were ever going to be brought or pursued. I believe that people around here rely on their guns because they have the right to. It's uh, their Second Amendment right to bear arms, so they feel like they can take things into their own hands. If you come into my home unannounced, then I have every right to defend myself. If I see someone else in danger, absolutely. But I believe it should be the last resort. You take it upon yourself to be God for a moment. Now you show me where that's right. You show me what scripture validates that. And then we'll have another conversation. I'm just baffled because someone being shot in the back is huge red flag. To not investigate is just a bold decision for someone to make. They say that Pat Chisholm was an outstanding person in the community and that he didn't deserve this and that this boy, Christian, was standing on Pat Chisholm on the front porch. And that's reason enough to get shot. That's what they told us. I mean, what's the definition of that? Who picks and chooses who the upstanding members of the community are? The sheriff department based off of the color of your skin. They call it here prosecutorial discretion. You are pushing to keep the case open, to have charges brought. You are finally told this is an upstanding member of this community, meaning a generational son of this community, also a white member of this community, also a reverend. We are going to side with him. What's your next step? We pursue looking for an attorney, and we got private investigators to look into our case. When I saw the inconsistencies with the narrative that had been told and the physical evidence, I immediately decided this was a situation where I wanted to help. When you first met with Tammy and Dolly, what happened? They showed me the medical examiner's report. Christian was shot six times, once in the shoulder, once in the abdomen, four times in the back. So... This issue of Christian coming through the window, being the aggressor, does it make sense 
with the medical examiner's report? Absolutely not. Okay. Common sense, if you're coming face forward through a window, mm -hmm. how do you get four bullets in your back? Moreover, the trajectory of those bullets indicate that he was laying on the ground face down at the time the shots were fired. We also know that the second bullet to the back paralyzed Christian. So there's no way he could have crawled from the window over into that corner where he was found is where he was shot. No way could he have crawled. There was no evidence of anybody dragging his body. No evidence of blood anywhere except immediately under the body. There was no blood at the window? No blood on the window. Were the shots to his shoulder and his abdomen life-threatening? No. According to the medical examiner, both those shots were easily survivable. The fatal shots were the shots to the back. And was he a threat laying face down on the porch? Does the Castle Doctrine apply to the death of Christian Graves? As I see it, absolutely not. surface this looks like a right to defend your home story but it takes very little effort to scratch that veneer and realize that this case demands a thorough investigation someone who did an extensive amount of digging in this case is lee denny I'm Lee Denny, I'm a private investigator, and I'm a North Carolina concealed carry instructor. In 2014, I was contacted by Griggs legal team, asking if I wanted to get involved in their investigation of the case. Let's talk about Pat Chisholm's narrative. In his walkthrough video, he says, I'll run it right here. He went to his closet, he got his gun. I grabbed that one. I came right in here. He came back into the living room. Christian was coming through the window, and he fired from behind that couch. I think I fired from here. What is the probability of that being true? Zero. Pat said he was shooting almost directly at the window, but there were no holes in the shades, curtains, or through the lower glass pane. You see, the improbability of Christian being able to climb in here and then take all the shots that he took without bullets passing through the bottom part of the window or anywhere else, it doesn't add up. No miss shots. Right. To hit a moving target with all of your shots is difficult. To stand there and, and do all that shooting and not miss, pretty much impossible. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, where could these shots have taken place where there wouldn't be any straight bullets? Outside on the front porch, uh -huh. which would be why his body was laying down in the position that he was laying and the angle of the bullets in his back. Then there's the shell casings that were found. You should be finding six somewhere in here. We asked law enforcement if they searched, and they said they did, and they only found these three shell casings. But how long did they search? I think they were there that day, that evening, and, and left. Had people been allowed to come onto the site? I, be I believe the Chisholm's came back later that night to the house. While there was still missing evidence? Yes, apparently so. Also, the three shell casings were found within about 12 inches of each other, mm -hmm. which is, I would say, more than highly unusual. The shell casings come out, they're ejected to the right for three to be found all together like that. That's not realistic. My impression, knowing how that firearm operates, seeing furniture, walls, and all that, tells me that those were collected and thrown over there. That's... It is the most probable thing, but it's also damning. Sure, sure it is. Because it brings the question, who did it? Uh -huh. According to the crime scene log, while police are still on the scene, 
Mr. Chisholm's son, Pat Chisholm Jr., is allowed to come in and out of the crime scene on two separate occasions. Certainly under no circumstances would you want a family member of a person who had just shot a man coming in and out of that shooting scene that is currently under investigation. All of these pieces put together say what to you? I'm thinking that this is not a self-defense shooting. Why aren't we charging Mr. Chisinau? I scheduled a meeting with the medical examiner, Dr. Scott. She said that she agreed with my theory. We got to the facts that it was not self-defense, but they still refused to do the right thing. I realized that the Hardy County Sheriff's Department and the DA wasn't going to do anything. So I had two choices to make. I had a choice to sit back and accept it, or I had a choice to fight. So I decided to fight. The DA had said pretty explicitly, we're not going to charge. Sheriff's Department said pretty explicitly that they thought this was a clear-cut case of self-defense. But there was a civil question at the heart of this about whether or not Pat Hall was responsible for the wrongful death of Christian Griggs. I wondered, could we ever convince the community, the jury, to break from the narrative that was put out there from the very start? Over the course of the trial, we put multiple county employees in the witness box. We questioned them about the missing shell casings, the evidence, and the timing of the 911 calls. Yes, Tommy, over here. I just called him working in my house. Two seconds after Pat's first 911 call ends, Katie calls 911 for a second time. At that point in time, we know Pat and Christian are out in the yard. There was no time for Christian to have broken into that house. Plant County 911, I just feel like Pat's second 911 call starts during Katie's second 911 call. Based upon the overlap, we know Christian had to have been shot during Katie's second 911 call. But on Katie's second 911 call, you don't hear any gunshots. He is working our house. I just called you. I said you were sending someone. That says to me, Katie was nowhere close to the gunfire, which says to me the shooting had to be outside. I think the biggest moment in the trial was when Mr. Chisholm took the stand. He blanketly claimed a general lack of recollection of anything at all when those four bullets would have been discharged into Christian's back. I have no memory of it, sir. At the time of the walkthrough with the police, Pat seems to have a good recollection of how he contends the shooting occurred. I think I fired from here. By the time we get to the civil trial and I've taken Mr. Chisholm's deposition, he can't remember a damn thing. As far as the shooting goes, the incident itself, anything after the glass broke, I don't remember anything. At the end, it was a relatively short jury deliberation. The verdict was broadcast on local media. The jury took an hour and a half to come back with a decision. Pat Chisenhall, an Andrew pastor, was not justified when he shot and killed his son-in-law, Christian Griggs. We've proven that it was not self-defense. We've got a jury verdict. They've got to arrest this guy now. They've got to do the right thing. But they didn't do anything. The day after the verdict, the sheriff issued a statement saying there would be no further investigation and there would be no criminal charges. They still have not done anything. The new DA that we have has not shown any interest. We've called her and she hasn't returned our phone calls. Josh Stein, the attorney general, needs to intervene. The Department of Justice needs to calm down and investigate the Harnett County Sheriff's Department. They need to do something. I'm supposed to remain impartial as a storyteller. 
but it makes me mad that there's no oversight. A young man was shot in the back in broad daylight, and no one has ever been held accountable for it. Those you guys were bringing me here. How often do you come out? I try to come out um, once a week. It's just him. Mm -hmm. I just, you guys put her picture on here with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also did this bit for him that Jamie can always have it to come out and just sit with him. How important is it to have her know how much her dad loved her? To know that the reason that he's not here today was because he was trying to have her a part of the, her, his life. It's very important. Nothing's going to bring Christian Griggs back. His family has the space. They've created a beautiful spot for his daughter to visit one day. And what they're asking for isn't big. They're asking for the bare minimum. They're asking for an investigation. They're asking for some oversight. These are people who have served their country. They've served their community. And I want to know who's serving them. I said, one day I'm going to kill you.